Hi everyone, this lesson is on the parasitic infection known as trichinosis. So trichinosis is also known as trichinellosis. It is an infection with a parasitic nematode species of the genus Trichinella. So it is a nematode, meaning that it is a worm-like parasite that can infect animals and humans. So trichinosis is going to be a foodborne infection that is acquired from consumption of uncooked or undercooked meat products. And more specifically, it's going to be pork or pork-related products that are going to be the primary sources of infection. Now, case numbers of trichinosis may not look like it is a significant health concern, but it may be that trichinosis is underrecognized or underreported. The case numbers that are reported do show that prevalence at least has been declining over the past several decades due to improving inspection standards. So improved farm inspection standards, improved meat handling procedures, and improved cooking procedures as well. But there are still increased numbers and outbreaks that occur in developing countries. And this condition, because it is from contaminated pork products, it is more common in countries with high pork consumption. So not only do pigs contain this parasitic nematode, but other species that may be consumed by humans are also hosts to this parasite as well. So some of these again include the domestic pig, but some include the wild boar and bears as well. So if any of these other species are consumed by humans, these species can also harbor these Trichinella species. So one example again is Trichinella spiralis, but there are other species of Trichinella that can cause infection and lead to trichinosis. So let's talk about how humans can be infected with this parasite. So as I mentioned before, it's going to be from patients consuming contaminated meat products. Most cases are going to be pork related, but we can see it from other animal species we talked about before. And it's going to come from when a patient eats a piece of contaminated meat that contains an encysted trichinella larva. So this encysted larva is going to be in the striated muscle, which is the meat of the animal. And when a human eats that encysted larva, it's going to go through their esophagus into their stomach and enter into the small intestine. The larva is then going to be released into the small intestine and then subsequently mature into an adult form of the trichinella species. So the adult nematodes are going to produce more larva. So they're going to become adults and they're going to produce more larva themselves. Now, in some cases, the larva can then invade the intestinal mucosa. The intestinal mucosa is the inner lining of the intestines. So they're going to, in some cases, invade through that intestinal mucosa and enter into the circulation of the patient. They're going to enter into the blood supply of the patient. We can then see in some patients the larva being deposited into their own striated muscle, so into their own skeletal muscle. So this can be anywhere in the body, including the arms or the legs. And what will happen is the larva will be deposited into that striated muscle and then a nurse cell will be produced. So a nurse cell is going to be the patient's own cell that is used to nourish the larva. So what's going to first happen is that when the larva gets into the striated muscle of the patient, the larva itself is going to become encapsulated. The host cell itself is going to produce nourishing capillaries to feed that larva. The host cell then undergoes basophilization, which means that the host cell itself becomes more basophilic. And then there's going to be certain alterations in the host cell itself. So there's going to be alterations in the nuclei position. If it's a multinucleated cell, there's going to be either increases or decreases in number of nuclei. And the position of the nucleus itself may be shifted due to this larva being implanted into the patient's striated muscle. Then the immune system is going to react to that trichinella larva and the trichinella larva metabolites. So this immune reaction is going to cause a lot of the signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the upcoming slides. So again, not all cases will lead to invasion into other bodily systems, but some cases can. So in the cases where it does leave the gastrointestinal system, this parasite, if it does leave the gastrointestinal system, it again enters into the circulatory system, the blood supply, and then it can enter into striated skeletal muscle and other bodily systems as well, which we didn't talk about in the last slide, but some of them can include the central nervous system or CNS, and some other systems can include the heart and the lungs. So these trichinella larvae can enter in and deposit into many different bodily systems, leading to many different signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the upcoming slides. So let's talk about the clinical features of trichinosis. So in some cases, patients that have been infected with this parasite can be asymptomatic, meaning that they don't have any symptoms at all. This is going to occur in patients with low numbers of infective organisms. If there's only a few larvae, they may not actually experience any symptoms at all. 
but the symptoms are going to occur when we can see larger numbers of infective organisms. If the patient has ingested large amounts of the trichinella species, or if they've had multiple cases where they've ingested small amounts and there's an increasing burden of infective organisms, then we can see symptoms in these patients most commonly. And there are three phases of this condition. One is going to be the intestinal phase, and as its name implies, it's going to be when the trichinella parasite is in the intestinal system. The second phase is going to be the invasive phase. So the invasive phase is when that parasite invades through the intestinal mucosa and enters into the circulation and invades other bodily systems. And then the third phase is going to be what is called the convalescent phase. The convalescent phase is where the patient is recovering and healing. So again, as I mentioned before, not all cases will progress through all phases, but as we will see, as we move through these phases, if patients undergo these further subsequent phases, they're more likely to experience symptoms, and we're going to talk about those here in a moment. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of each of those phases. Again, these are only going to occur in patients who are symptomatic. So in the intestinal phase, if patients are symptomatic, the most common symptom is going to be diarrhea. So again, this is the most common finding. In other cases, patients may experience constipation, although this is going to be less common. Patients can also experience anorexia, so they lose their appetite and they can have some weight loss. They can also experience nausea and vomiting in some cases. They can also experience abdominal discomfort. And these signs and symptoms can last on average from two to seven days. So they can be vague, could look like a gastroenteritis for instance, but as we will see if they progress into the next phase, we can then start to see some more characteristic findings. So let's talk about the invasive phase next. So as I mentioned before, symptoms are going to be more likely to occur in this phase. So in the intestinal phase, patients may have some of those vague gastrointestinal complaints. They may have some diarrhea. Again, that's going to be the most common symptom. But in the invasive phase, this is where we're going to see more manifested symptoms. So if it is the musculoskeletal system that is involved, which is going to be a common occurrence in trichinosis in those who experience the invasive phase, we're going to see myositis and myalgias. So myositis and myalgias are going to be inflammation of the skeletal muscles. Again, you can imagine if there's insisted larva in the striated skeletal muscle, that's going to lead to inflammation in that muscle. So the patient's going to complain of aches and pains in the muscles. And patients that do have musculoskeletal system involvement are going to be 90% likely to have myositis and myalgias. So if they do have invasion into their skeletal muscle, they're almost certainly going to have myalgias or myositis. Now in some cases, as mentioned before, the central nervous system can become involved. So in that case, if there is CNS involvement, we can see headache, and a headache can occur in more than 50% of patients. And because of the involvement of the central nervous system, there is risk of mortality, so it's very important to recognize central nervous system involvement of trichinosis. As mentioned before, the pulmonary system or the lungs can be involved as well. So this is going to occur in roughly a third of patients. These patients can experience cough, they can experience dyspnea, and these pulmonary symptoms can last for up to five days. And some other signs and symptoms that can occur in trichinosis can include periorbital edema. So periorbital edema is going to be edema around the eyes. A fever can also occur, and we can also see issues with ECG changes if there is any involvement of the heart, for instance. And symptoms of the invasive phase can last for weeks to months. In the last phase, the convalescent phase, this is where the larva encystment and repair occurs. So this is where the body starts to deal with the larva and repairing the tissue that has been damaged by the larva. So it starts to deal with the damage to the skeletal muscle or some other bodily systems as well. So in this phase, symptoms are most commonly going to begin to improve at two months. But again, this phase can take months to years for full improvement. Symptoms that may occur during the convalescent phase include the following. Cachexia. So cachexia is where the patient becomes very thin, loses a lot of weight, loses a lot of muscle mass. And then edema. Edema is going to be where there's swelling in certain parts of the body. So these can be some of the signs and symptoms of the convalescent phase. Now that we know the signs and symptoms, how do clinicians diagnose trichinosis? So serology is going to be important in diagnosing this condition. So serology looking for anti-trichinella antibodies. So the important thing about serology looking for these antibodies is that they're going to be positive usually only after two to three weeks of infection. And the antibodies themselves, once they are present, can last for months to years. So when looking at a patient that has a lot of those signs and symptoms we talked about before, if it's early on infection, you may not see the anti-trichinella antibodies. And another point to make note of is that 
even after a patient has cleared this infection, they can have these antibodies. So if, for instance, years later, if they have certain signs and symptoms and there's some suspicion of trichinosis, if they were to check for these antibodies, they will be present, but it may not be due to a present condition. It may have been due to a past infection with this condition. So sometimes these antibodies can be tricky to utilize, especially if too early on an infection and if it's been many years since a patient has been infected with this condition. And then ELISA or enzyme-linked immunosorbin assay is highly sensitive and specific for trichinosis. And there is other blood work that's very important for trichinosis as well. So doing a CBC or a complete blood count is going to be important. So looking at white blood cells, leukocytosis or high elevated white blood cell count is going to occur in the majority of patients. And then more specifically, when we look at the eosinophils, so those are going to be the white blood cells that are active in parasitic infections, they are going to be elevated as well. So eosinophilia is going to occur in patients with trichinosis, and it's going to occur at roughly 10 days into infection. So it's going to take a little time before the eosinophils are going to elevate. And there's going to be a peak level of these eosinophils at roughly three to four weeks. And essentially all patients with trichinosis will have eosinophilia unless it is a very, very severe condition where there is suppression of eosinophils. And then another important blood marker to look for is creatine kinase or CK. So creatine kinase is going to be something that's present in muscles. So because in patients who have that skeletal muscle involvement, that larva get insisted into skeletal muscle, they can lead to damage of those skeletal muscle, leading to release of creatine kinase. So in those patients with skeletal muscle involvement, they can have elevated CK or elevated creatine kinase. And then another blood marker that can be used is immunoglobulin E. So immunoglobulin E is also going to be increased in cases of trichinosis as well. So a lot of the diagnoses are going to be made by looking at the history of the patient, seeing that they've eaten contaminated pork products, seeing that they have some of those signs and symptoms we talked about in the last few slides, and then doing this blood work to see some of these elevations we talked about here. But other cases can be diagnosed by muscle biopsy. So this is actually going to be the definitive way to diagnose this condition. So if there is skeletal muscle involvement, taking a muscle biopsy to see the trichinella larva is going to be a definitive diagnosis. And then some other ways to perform diagnostic methods include a CT scan and MRI of the head if there is any suspicion of CNS involvement. An ECG can be used if there's any suspicion of cardiac involvement. And then a lumbar puncture can be used in patients with central nervous system involvement as well. So in some cases, they can actually see the larva in the lumbar puncture. Once a clinician has diagnosed this condition, how do they treat it? So albendazole or mebendazole are going to be the anti-helminthic treatments that are used to treat trichinosis. So with regards to albendazole, it's going to be roughly five milligrams per kilogram per day for seven days. And it's especially going to be effective early on in the course of the disease, especially within the first three to seven days. It can be taken or given after the patient has consumed contaminated meat products. So this is another way to essentially try to prevent the spread of the trichinella larva from invading past the gastrointestinal mucosa and getting into the skeletal muscle. So it's, again, used to treat trichinosis, but also to prevent the trichinosis from getting into other bodily systems. So albendazole and mebendazole are going to be the treatments that are most often used to treat trichinosis, but in some cases, in some patient populations, pyrantol is going to be used. So pyrantol is going to be used for children under the age of two and for pregnant patients. And the doses are going to range from 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram for a single dose. So these are going to be some of the medical treatments for trichinosis. If you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.